Um, we're going to record this. So my name's John Lee. I'm with the St. Louis Real Estate Investors Association. Uh, this is, what, what is this? Uh, November 17th. Okay. 2020. And um, tonight we're, we're, uh, we got a really special, special broadcast for you. This is our, our main event. It's the last one of the year. Um, we, we are uh, really happy to have a special guest tonight. Let me introduce him. Then we're going to have a panel coming up. So we got, a, it's a two part uh, segment tonight. Um, first, we're very, we're very happy to have, um, well, you know, if you've ever attended a workshop, a seminar, social uh, functions, uh, you know that we, we must have one thing and that's an elevator speech. That's your personal infomercial that quickly tells folks, well, who you are, what you do and who is a prospect for your business or what job opportunity you are looking for. Today's presenter is a speaker, an international coach and an author. His books, No Sweat Public Speaking and No Sweat Elevator Speech are selling internationally and receiving rave reviews on Amazon. He's a TEDx Talks coach and has been interviewed by local, national, and international media. His podcast channel is one of the top 25 public speaking podcasts on the web. He, like many of us, has ups and downs with his elevator speech. Years ago, he got serious about crafting one and developed elevator speech templates that work very well for him and will get you results. If your elevator speech has been challenging, a challenging activity, or you want to fine tune the one you have, our speaker has a message for you. I did a little research and discovered our guest speaker has been in the coffee service business for many years. Since he used to sell coffee, I ask him to perk up our meeting and not let it become a grind. <laughs> I've been told he expressos himself well and would never be considered a drip. I don't want to spill the beans on his talk, and I'm curious, as I'm sure you are, to see and hear what he's brewed up for us tonight. <laughs> The title of his talk is The Elevator Speech, How to Craft Yours Floor by Floor with No Sweat. Please help me welcome Fred Miller. Oh, John, that was a great introduction. Thanks, a latte. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get started on the elevator speech, I want to, whoops, I got to go back here. Still this medium, I'm still trying to learn. I got to talk about this medium that we're on right now. And let me tell you, give you a little bit of the backstory. March 13th, we were in, excuse me, March 17th, we were in South Africa when COVID broke out. We barely got out. It was a, it was a 16 hour flight with 300 people from Johannesburg to Atlanta. We got off, everything was shutting down. Uh, they took our temperature, gave us a piece of paper, said go home and quarantine. And the world we left is not the world we came back to, right? I mean, it has not been the same for anyone. And I started getting on some of these Zoom meetings and it's like, whoa, I mean, this is really, really different. I didn't do anything for about a month. And then I thought, I'm gonna do something about these Zoom meetings. So I wanna give a few tips, virtual tips that I've learned about this meeting or any of the other uh, software that we're dealing with. First of all, update to the latest and the greatest. Uh, before I got on today, they had just say it updated again. And those updates are for a reason. And if you're not on the latest and the greatest, there's going to be something that wor won't work as well as it should. First thing that happens when you get onto a Zoom meeting, people look at you. It's very important. That's what we all do. We look at you. We look at the name. And you want to be sure you have some good light on yourself so they can see you. I mean, I've looked at a lot of people and they're literally sitting in the dark. Now, I, I researched this a little bit and I've got a, you can see I've got a halo light. Looks like I'm from Mars, but I went out and invested in a halo light. You don't have to do that, but lighting is very, very important. The other thing that's just as important is they have a good camera. Some people have older computers and you're broadcasting at a low resolution and you want to look good, don't you? So when this broke out, it was funny. I got online. You couldn't buy a camera. You couldn't buy lights. You couldn't buy a green screen. 
So it's real important to have a better camera in some cases than your computer has. And when you have that camera, look right at it. <laughs> it is amazing how many noses I have looked up. <laughs> I think I've looked up more at more nostrils than my uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor. And people, you know, you only have one chance to give a first impression, but some of those first impressions are, are really not so good. The next thing is sound. People will watch bad video. They won't listen to bad audio. And again, if you have an older computer and you're seeing way back, it, it sounds like you're in a tunnel. And you see this on the national news. You see with correspondents who've been, you know, they're working from home and they should know better. You can hardly hear them. And one of the things in terms of that, invest in a good microphone. You can get one that stands, but quite frankly, I like this lavalier microphone because I can get back from the computer and you still hear me well. Now, I've learned this the hard way. When you get on, be sure that that's the microphone and, and going back to the camera, that those are the ones that you want to use. The next thing we look at is the background. I've seen backgrounds like this. And this is really important. We cannot multitask. If you're looking at the background, you're not looking at that individual. And, and the best example I can give for this is if you're watching any of the cable news shows, you see that little ticker tape goes along the bottom of the screen. If you're reading that ticker tape, you have no idea what they're talking about. And to prove that, as soon as the commercial comes on, that ticker tape is gone. Advertisers would never pay for that. So you don't want it, but background looks like this. It's just all clutter. Or, or you might have a background like this. Somebody's sitting in front of a window. It looks like there's a helicopter landing on them. And I've seen backgrounds that are this messy. And a lot of times somebody's promoting their book. It's all clutter. It's all clutter. The best background is the one you don't notice. And it's really important. Now you can invest in a green screen if you want, but at least have a solid background so people are not distracted. Really, really important. I've got a checklist on this and when we get through the presentation, I'll tell you how to get that. Any, any questions about this Zoom? Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Any other observations? Have you seen the same thing I've seen? And it's very distracting. So get good light, have a good microphone, have a good camera. Oh, the reason we're here, a little elevator music. Well, it's like John said, we've all been there. You go to a networking event, a social function or a seminar, and the leader says, uh, you know what, before we get started, and you do on Zoom meetings too, uh, let's go around the Zoom. <laughs> Tell us who you are, what you do, give us your elevator speech. You know, and for many of us, uh, let me go ahead here, I want to show something. It's, whoop, it, it, it's, it's like this, you get scared. It's a terrible thing to do. You don't wanna give that elevator speech. Now, personally for me, it's always been a religious moment because I've been thinking, please don't call me first. <laughs> I know I should have been ready for this. Uh, next time we have this, I'm gonna be prepared. But then those elevator speeches start and uh, some are very good. You know, example might be, uh, my, my name is John. I'm an estate planning attorney. I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, you may have seen me interviewed on local media. Uh, if you have an estate plan and you'd like to get reviewed or you're thinking about one, let's have a conversation. I'd be very comfortable talking to John or referring him because he sounds like he knows what he's doing. Some of them are just boring. And, and you've heard these. I'm Louise. I'm a bookkeeper. Glad to be here. Why would I want to talk to Louise? She said nothing that distinguishes herself from anyone else. And I'm certainly not gonna refer her. And then some are just shocking. You know, I've, I've got a friend, if he sells 10 products, he'll tell you about 15. And then he goes on and on as somebody's ringing that bell because his time is up. Even though he's a friend, why would you wanna deal with him? And you probably are not gonna to wanna to refer him. And some try to be really cute. You know, uh, I'm Bobby, your financial plumber. I'm going to show you how to flush all your money problems down the toilet. Yeah, really? And they'll start drawing circles. And there's nothing wrong with uh, multi-level. But, but tell us what you do. I may have an interest. I may know somebody with a downline who wants to connect with you. But, but don't try to be cutesy with it, you know? And if you were on an elevator with these people, <laughs> you'd want to get right off. 
So going forward, we're going to talk about what is an elevator speech, the different audiences for it, I'm going to give some goals. We may talk about how to deliver it, we may not. And I'm going to give you three elevator speeches of mine, uh, some pointers on delivering those elevator speeches, and we're going to have some question, time for questions after each section. And then we'll conclude the presentation. So what is an elevator speech? Well, it came from the original idea. You get into an elevator and uh, Lloyd says, hey, Fred, what do you do? <laughs> and by the time we get to the next floor, he knows what I do. Well, personally, I've never given an elevator speech in an elevator, but, but the concept that is good. Here's some guidelines for those elevator speeches. Number one, make it short. I've actually learned less is more. Number two, <laughs> No selling. You know, selling, if it is to occur, will occur later. An elevator speech is basically a sorting and sifting mechanism. So you're sorting and sifting the people you give your elevator speech to. These are suspects. These are prospects. These are people I want to contact right away. These are people, uh, I'll contact them. Uh, maybe I'll put that in the trash, those people. But that's what elevator speeches should be for. They're not for selling. They're for sorting and sifting. Clarity is not optional. How many times have you heard somebody give an elevator speech and you have no idea what they do? Clarity is not optional. So let's talk about the goals of the elevator speech. Well, the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal of an elevator speech is a conversation. And it's a conversation with somebody who wants to possibly do business with you. They want to know how you work, what does it cost, are there any warranties? That's the ultimate goal. There are some immediate goals though. And those immediate goals are with a large audience, which would be like this, or if you're talking one-on-one. -on -one. And the immediate goals are this. I would love to have somebody say right away, hey, stop talking, I need to talk to you, give me a card, let's make an appointment. That would be great. Another immediate goal would be someone says, you know, I know what you do, but uh, I don't need that right now. If I ever do in the future, I'd be happy talking to you, and that'd be great. And the third goal, equally as important, you want somebody to be able to refer you. Wouldn't that be great? So ultimately, the ideal elevator speech, you've said so well that if you ask anyone who heard it, they can say, I'll tell you what Fred does. That's a great test of an elevator speech. If you really want to test it, if you have a great one, you've given it, and those hearing it can tell people what you do. There's the one-on-one -on -one elevator speech too, and that has an additional goal, and that is to disqualify. Everyone's not a prospect for what you do. You're not gonna buy everything that people offer to you. So disqualifying is really, really important. Let me tell you a story. I was at a networking event at a Chamber of Commerce in North County, and the instructions were, we have a speaker at noon, arrive early and network, right? So I got there and networked and there was a young lady selling replacement windows for older homes. I was very familiar with the company, it was a national company. The distributor had been in business a long, long time and she had a great elevator speech, but she was giving it to each and every individual she met. And there were people she was talking to who lived in apartments, had newer homes and were not prospects for new windows. And quite frankly, this was a very high-end window. And even people with older homes were not prospects for it. She was wasting their time and her time. So disqualifying is huge. Whatever you do, you don't want to waste their time and don't waste your time. So that's a big thing. I'm going to give you my ultimate elevator speech, but let me give you the backstory because it's all about stories. And this telling stories goes hand in hand with giving presentations. And if you've heard me speak before, or read any of my stuff, you know my mantra is speaking opportunities are business, career, and leadership opportunities. And it's all about the story. Personal stories are the emotional glue that connect your audience to your message. I was in a group called E4E, Experts for Entrepreneurs. And the leader, Bill, came to me one day. He said, that, hey, Fred, you're our public speaking expert. How about a presentation next month to the group on how to develop practice and give a great elevator speech? And I thought, oh, geez, mine stinks. I've always struggled with it. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> but 
but I knew it was something I had to have. So I thought, well, where, where am I going to do this? How am I going to get it going? Well, the very next day, I was in my sales class, and we had a newbie. And as uh, always happens with newbies, the instructor said, uh, hey, before we get started, we've got a new student today. Uh, let's go around the room. Everyone, when it's your turn, stand up, tell them who you are, what you do, give them your elevator speech. Well, my stunk, and most of them did, but Roy was sitting next to me. And Roy had a phrase that was so good that literally everyone, I think we had 13 in the class at the time, everyone wrote that phrase down. And that phrase, and I'll tell you in a little while, that's what got me started on this elevator speech template. So I, because frankly, uh, I want to show you this guy, there's some people in business you don't want to deal with, right? <laughs> Another reason to disqualify. So I base this elevator speech template on two words, elevator, build it by the floor. Everyone doesn't want to go to the top floor with you. You don't want to take everyone there. You may want to skip floors. And the other thing is speech. And I'm going to say it again. A speech is a speaking opportunity. Speaking opportunities are business career and leadership opportunities. They're business career and leadership opportunities. And elevator speech is a mini speech presentation. I also knew that this elevator speech template had to be multifaceted. You could use it for in front of a large group, a small group, and one-on-one. -on -one. Again, the goal there is also to disqualify. You can also use it as an individual for a company, for a nonprofit, for employed people, unemployed people, and for departments. I, I once gave this presentation on MasterCard, and I said, why am I here? And they said, well, shipping doesn't know what marketing does, doesn't know what accounting does. And they had a great elevator speech presentation to each other. Also clubs. Oh, speak of the devil, right? <laughs> Clubs. But you also want to be able to give this elevator speech on an escalator, moving sidewalks, stairs. One prime thing about an elevator speech we talked about, it's got to be short. Build it in 15 second increments. The bottom line, it should clearly articulate what you do very concisely and have an impact. So less is more. And I've developed this and redeveloped them in the process of rewriting the book. I've learned so much since I wrote, but less is more. People want to get it. Because if somebody's wondering, I have no idea what Catherine does. Well, how are they going to hire you? How are they going to refer you? The bottom line with all communication, verbal, written, or visual is the same. We want the recipients as quickly as possible to get it. Now, they may not agree with everything you say. They may not agree with anything. But if they don't get it, you can't have a meaningful conversation going forward. So let me give you a little story in a non-elevator speech that does just what an elevator speech should do. I had a 98 Ford Explorer. I had 135,000 miles on the vehicle. Loved it. Had a few dents. That's not all bad. You pull into a parking spot, people on either side leave. <laughs> or, you, or you come to a four-way stop and they go, you Go ahead. But anyway, I needed brakes on. So I sent out word to friends and family, you know, an independent mechanic. And I got Danny's name. And I called up Danny. And I said, Danny, uh, here's what I've got. Can you put brakes on? He says, yeah. I said, well, and I started asking all these questions about cars. I know nothing about cars. And after about five questions, Danny stopped me and said, Fred, I went to Rankin Technical School. I'm ASC certified. You're in good hands. I said, done, Danny. When, when, when can you come over? I never even asked the guy's price. You know, and he was a rough looking mechanic. <laughs> Some people might have passed that guy up, but he was golden. And, and he did a lot of work on that car. And I'd go out with him to buy parts. And I didn't care whether he picked out the most expensive or the cheapest. He was just honest. I trusted him. And it was fair in his pricing. He was so honest that at one point he said, I got to tell you, Fred, your, your next repair is going to cost more than this vehicle is worth. And, and remember cash for clunkers? Any of you pay taxes? Thank you. <laughs> I took advantage. I traded that in. But Danny was a gem. And just by saying I went to Rankin, we're all familiar with Rankin here in St. Louis, nationally recognized trade school, ASE certified. If you've ever been to a professional garage, you've seen that logo. Done. Isn't that beautiful? I just love that. So what questions do you have about what we've talked about so far in terms of the elevator speech? Anybody? Does it make sense to you?
Okay, that's good. Okay, let's go for it. Okay, so this is my ultimate elevator speech. This is the one I would get in from a large group like this. I'm Fred Miller. I'm going to speak. Now, this is a template for it, which you'll be able to get. Okay, I'm Fred Miller. I'm a speaker, coach, and an author. The title of my first book is No Sweat Public Speaking. Businesses, individuals, and organizations hire me because they want to improve their networking, public speaking, and presentation skills. They do that because they know speaking opportunities are business, career, and leadership opportunities. They also know we perceive really good speakers as experts. We like to work with experts. Experts command more money for their products and services. I show them how to develop, practice, and deliver a knock your socks off presentation with, as John would say, no sweat. And that's it. Now everyone should know exactly what I do. But let's do this. Let's break it down by the floor. It starts simple. And as we go up the elevator and time permits, it's expanded. So I'm going to put this in my world, put it in your world. Think about in terms of the real estate investment, whatever else you do. All right, first floor describes who you are. I'm Fred Miller. Now, I have a very simple name. I have a friend, Mike Ramatoski. And my advice to Mike is say, hi, I'm Mike. <laughs> Because the problem with a last name like that, people are going to say, oh, is it S-K-I, S-K-Y? What's the derivation? You know, just get out, Mike. If they want to know more, and hopefully they do, they'll stop you and find out. Oh, we get in the elevator. Let's go up. <laughs> the second floor describes what you do. I speak, coach, and write about networking, public speaking, and presentation skills. Three very simple words. And people should be thinking, what does he speak about? What does he coach? And what does he write about? That tells what you do. Third floor, but let me talk about, I'm going to take a little break here and talk about how important three is. Three is magical. In terms of public speaking, it's really good. We, uh, we always talk about three wise men, third time's a charm, uh, Mo, Larry, Harry, <laughs> father, son, Holy Ghost. But three gives completeness. Use one for, uh, one for emphasis. So Zoom is, is, is the best we have right now. It's really good. Not as good as being in person, but Zoom is a great, great uh, software piece to use. Two for comparison, hot, cold, fast, slow, up, down. Three for completeness. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. Four or more for a list, shopping list or to-do list. So three, I speak, coach, and write about networking, public speaking, and presentation skills. If you want the audience to get it, you need to educate, entertain, and explain. Speaking opportunities are, uh, speaking opportunities are business, career, and leadership opportunities. A great elevator speech should be clear, clean, and consistent. Three is magical. And you do this intuitively, but now that you know it, when you work on your elevator speeches or presentations, if you have two things, goose it up to three. If you have four or more, drop it down. Three is magical. So clarity is not optional. So senior technical manager, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, a salesperson, what do, you, what do you sell? Training designer, well, what kind of training? Uh, technical, dog training? Uh, IT professional, well, that's great. Uh, software or hardware? Engineer, well, what kind of an engineer? Mechanical, uh, choo-choo? <laughs> you gotta be specific. People have to know what you do exactly or they can't refer you. So the third floor describes your expertise. The title of my first book is No Sweat Public Speaking. Writing a book is huge, right, John? It gives you all kinds of credibility. And my suggestion, if you haven't written a book, when you write your own elevator speech or you write your own introduction because you're gonna be introduced and John did a great job with my introduction, put in that introduction, the title of your upcoming book is. Let me tell you a story. I made a commitment to write a book. I wrote it into my introduction. I'm speaking at a huge chamber. And the guy's reading my introduction, he goes, blah, blah, blah. 
And the title of his upcoming book is, you, you have a book coming out? I said, I do. He says, that's amazing. It is huge. It's a game changer. Isn't that right, John? It's a game changer to have a book. You didn't tell him when it's coming out. You can change the title, but having a book come out is huge. And I got to tell you, it does not have to be a huge book. I know a young lady who does, wrote a book about networking and that thing is this thin, but she is promoting the heck out of it and doing a marvelous job. It is huge. So we have that in there. And then once you've written the first book and people will say, what's the title of your second book? Say, oh, I wish I could tell you, but I've signed all these non-disclosures with my attorney and the publisher. I'd probably go to jail if I said anything. And I know everyone's got a book in there. Now you hope you want to have it relayed to what you do, but having a book is huge. Now, if you don't have a book, there, there's some real important things that you want to include in your elevator speech, some of those special skills that you have and celebrate those skills. You know, years in the industry, that's very important. Certifications, and if you have certifications, don't just put that alphabet soup up there. Tell people what it is. You know, awards that you've won, describe the award. Patents, if somebody has a, a degrees. I was coaching a guy once he has a master's degree. He didn't even tell anyone. That's incredible. Special skills you may have. I know a lady who does QuickBooks and she has a real special niche in there that not, not many people have. Titles are important. People love to work with the founder, the CEO, the president, the owner, the general partner. Titles are really, really important. In fact, that reminds me of a story when I was in the coffee business. I know we got this account at Southwestern Bell when it was Southwestern Bell. And the lady's writing up this contract and she handed it over. She said, now, will you sign this? And uh, what should I put as your title? I go, I don't know, I have a partner. So I said, uh, president. She sat up straighter. It's, it's that important. So if you're president of your own company, a lot of you are, let people know that. People love that. They love dealing with the owner. They love dealing with the person who can make decisions. And when I'm selling, I want to deal with the person who can say no, quite frankly. You know? So those are important. So the fourth floor is why they hire me. Because speaking opportunities are business, career, and leadership opportunities. That's why pe people hire me because they want to improve their networking, public speaking, and presentation skills. Hire me is a phrase that my friend used. Hire me is huge. Most people say, I work with companies. I help people, right? I help people invest. I work with companies. No, you know, if you're, if you're independently wealthy, God bless you, keep doing it. But hire me says, I'm good at this. I'm proud of it. And you know what? There's some jack connected to it. It's huge. Now, if you're not comfortable with hiring me, don't use it because you're, the way you say it, your communication will tell people you don't like it. So use other things like choose me. I, I know a gal, in fact, it was a real estate lady. She said, people buying and selling homes, choose me. Think about when you fly Southwest Airlines, we won't be flying for a while, but Southwest Airlines, when you land, that pilot says, we know you have choices. When you fly, thank you for flying Southwest Airlines. Or say, put me on their payroll, write me checks, anything but work with and help. But I like that hire me. That gets right to it. I've said it and people go, whoa. I said, are we finished? No, no, no. I like, go, go on. You know, they like somebody who's proud of what they do. You know, you want to work with a wimp? I actually had a lady stop me in a conference once. She said, you got a little attitude with that hire me, don't you? I said, well, yeah, you want to work with somebody who's not proud of what they do? No, 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 I didn't say that. <laughs> the other word is because. Hire me because. Because is an influencer word. And if you think about when your kid, you say, well, mom, why do I have to? Because I said so. Because that's what you got to do. So hire me because. That is huge. Okay. The fifth floor is your why. Businesses, individuals, and organizations hire me because they know speaking opportunities are business, career, and leadership opportunities. That's my why. And if you don't agree with that, and that's fine, you know, I, I want to disqualify, then we really have nothing to talk about. That's okay. Go on. If you're talking to somebody that you want to get to be an investor and they have no interest, don't try to convince them. There's plenty of people who want to do that. Move on. 
but that's my why. Now, how many of you heard of Simon Sinek, the golden circle? All right, here. The golden circle, that's your why. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Nobody cares except why you do. When they buy into your why, that's what you want. Simon Sinek, let me watch, let you watch this. Probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief, and why should anyone care? The inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Nah. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? People don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. Isn't that great? I've, I've watched his video, look at it, look it up on TED Talk and there's a whole lot more to it. I and mean, he's got some great stories. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. That's the DNA of your elevator speech. When you know your why, that makes all the difference in the world. And it helps you eliminate and disqualify those people. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Okay. The sixth floor is more of why they hire me. In my case, it's because we believe people who are great speakers are experts and we like to work with experts. You know, next floor, this is what I deliver. This is what they pay me to do. I show them how to develop, practice, and deliver a knock your socks off presentation with no sweat. Now, there's another floor if you're dealing one on one. <laughs> that bell. Remember the old famous bar every time that elevator opened up. Eighth floor is asking what they do. Yeah, you know, enough about me. What do you do? Or you could turn into a prospecting question. I could say, hey, enough about me and what I do. What, what do the folks at your place do about public speaking and presentation skills training? And then you made it into a prospecting question. So this is a template again, and I'm, I'm gonna show you how to get it in, in a little bit, but this is just a tool. And the nice thing about it, you can start on the ground floor or you could skip a floor. For instance, I could say, who believes speaking opportunities are business, career, and leadership opportunities? You know, I'm Fred Miller. I speak, coach, and write about networking, public speaking, and presentation skills. You know, you might be talking to somebody about financial security, uh, about all kinds of things, but those are what people buy. And then you can jump around. So it's a little review. First floor is who you are. <laughs> Second floor is what you do. I speak, coach, and write. And again, put all this into your world. Third floor, that's your credibility. And you all have a book coming out, I know. Uh, <laughs> so the upcoming... Yeah, the title of your upcoming book is, that's really important. Next floor, I, uh, let me see. <laughs> I'm, hire me to, I talk about networking, business, networking presentation skills. Uh, the fifth floor is my why, because speaking opportunities are business, career, and leadership opportunities. Sixth floor is a little more why, because we perceive people who speak well as experts. We like to work with experts. Seventh floor is my USP, unite, unique selling proposi proposition. What they hire me to do, what they give me money to do. I show them how to develop, practice, and deliver a knock your socks off presentation. And the eighth floor, I ask them. Well, that's what those are. Let's, let's have, uh, there's gotta be some questions about that. Maybe somebody give me your why. And then we've got a couple other elevator speeches. Any, any questions on this? Anyone wanna give me their why? 
Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you keep it brief, Fred. Um, you, you've kind of simplified this because everybody, there's so many people, I go to the networking things like you do. And so I, I don't even understand what half the people do out there. They don't even know how to, they don't know how to tell me. The communication is so bad. And what you've done is put it all down in here in really simple steps. Less is more. That's the aha I got here. Less is more. Well, you make a good point, John. And, and the other thing, and, and thanks for reminding me, simple language. Use buzzwords, acronyms, techno speak. And there's technical language in, in the real estate field. I have no idea. You know, like lawyers, every industry has their own buzzwords, acronyms. You don't impress people with words they don't know. You make them feel stupid and they will not work with you. And we all see the emperor with no clothes, mm -hmm. but nobody says anything. I work with people or financial planners, and they'll have a room full of people and talk about EFTs or ETFs. I'm not sure what it is, and mm -hmm. derivatives and mutual funds, and people are sitting there going, uh-huh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't have a clue. <laughs> they don't have a clue. The best communicators make it really, really simple. And a lot of companies are realizing we just had a furnace changed and I complimented the technician on his communication because he made it simple for me to understand. I don't understand those type of things. Mm -hmm. And you really make somebody feel uncomfortable using the kind of language. There's all kinds of loans in your industry and all kinds of technical work and contracts and stuff. And you start talking about that. I feel real stupid. And I can't wait to walk away. So it's real important. And your point, John, we're going to have a couple of other elevator speeches. So the one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes, and I talked about this before, we need to disqualify. Don't waste major time on minor possibilities, their time or your time. So when they say, what do you do? We're going to give them the express elevator speech. <laughs> there it goes. And it goes like this. The bottom line, again, you want to clearly articulate what you do very concisely and you want to have an impact. So what do you do? Here's the formula. Question, give them your why and question. So if John would say to me, hey, Fred, I'm John, what do you do? I'd say, well, John, thanks for asking. I'm going to answer your question by asking you one. Have you ever been to an event and you're watching and listening to the speaker and you're thinking to yourself, Oh, that guy's good. I mean, he is really good. He's articulate, authentic, very entertaining. I'm really getting a lot of this presentation. The guy has a passion for what he's doing. Man, I wish I could do that. I'm the guy they hire to develop, practice, and deliver presentations like that. Now, if you haven't given me your card, say, oh, Fred, we got to talk because I got to get presentations and build my business. I'm going to go for no. And I'll say, John, I got to tell you, everyone who hires me knows speaking opportunities are business, career, and leadership opportunities. You, you probably don't know anyone who wants to improve their public speaking and presentation skills, do you? And we're done. We're done. Yeah, very simply, simple words, simple language. And if you're not a prospect, not a problem. There's plenty of people who see the value of what I do. There's plenty of people who see the value of what you guys do. And don't waste major time on minor possibility. And people say, well, they're going to know somebody someday. Eh, go on. There's plenty of people. <laughs> oh, Twitter type elevator speech. I'm sorry. Sometimes you're in a big group. And oh, gosh, real quickly, in X number of words or less, tell us what you do. I speak, coach, and write about networking, public speaking, and presentation skills. Real simple. You know what I do. Mm -hmm. and, and to John's point, sometimes you come out of these networking events, you have no idea what anybody does. And the best test is that everyone there can repeat what you do. Everyone here should know exactly what I do. If somebody ever said, well, you know, I saw Fred spoke to you the other night, what did he do? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. He just made up <laughs> All right. So here's what I'm going to give everyone. I've got a video meeting checklist, has a lot of stuff on it. I've got a speaker's template because then now I know everyone wants to give presentations like this. Mm -hmm. I've got the express elevator speech template, got a speech plate, uh, elevator speech template with a worksheet so you can figure it out yourself. So write that down, Fred at No Sweat Public Speaking. Just email me, put templates, and uh, I'll get those to you. So what questions do you have for me? And if you don't have a question, give me your why. Lloyd, did you say you were working on your why? 
Can you repeat your email, but slower? Oh, I'm sorry. I'd speak too quick. We'll put it in Fred, there. Fred, Fred, well, let me get back on the screen. Fred at no sweat public And my website, no sweat public I've been blogging since 2011. Uh, and for, let me just give it a little tip for all those who have websites. Here's something I've learned. Uh, I had some good mentors. I blog every two weeks. I used to blog once a week, 300 words or less. I take that blog post and I record the audio I put into an iTunes podcast channel. Mm -hmm. A couple important things about that. First of all, it's another thing that Google can find. Secondly, well, I'll go back and let me tell you the story. Uh, Russ Henneberry. Uh, Russ Henneberry was one of my mentors. I go to his site one day and I saw that little audio icon next to his blog post. So I click it and he's reading his post. And I'm reading along with him and I think, wait a minute, why am I reading it? I mean, this is the author. He's reading with the inflection and the emphasis he wants. I can refer to the text. And I thought, what a great idea. I mean, Google's finding his text. They're finding his audio. I'm going to do that. And I recorded my first audio. It was a very humbling experience. <laughs> I, found, I found grammatical errors. I found spelling errors. And, and the audio... Oh my gosh, it was terrible. It's like, I'm supposed to be a speaker. I was speaking too quickly. I was mumbling, words trailed off. But I will tell you this, the combination of written post plus audio post will make you a better writer and a better speaker. And that discipline of blogging on a regular basis, it gets out there, lets the world know that you're an expert. And every time you do it, you learn something. You learn something. But if you really want to learn, so if you want to take it to another level, this is worth mentioning too. Teach it. When, when people go to med school, they are told, see one, do one, teach one. Mm -hmm. I talked to a doctor about this and he said, if I can perform that surgery from across the room or maybe you know, by Zoom, I've mastered it. If you really want to learn something, teach it. It's huge because then you become the master of what you do. And you're always learning something, always learning something. So uh, let's have some, what your whys are, or elevator speeches for us to critique or ask me any questions. Mm -hmm. Does this make sense to you? Yes. Anybody else? Hey, I'm Kathy. Hi, Fred. Um, I just Hi, wanted Kathy. to say thank you. I love that you started with don't sell. That's huge. I've heard so many elevator speeches where they're trying to get me to buy something at that moment. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's frustrating. Thank you. Um, and well, you know, to your point, I remember years ago, John may remember that there was a uh, swim with the sharks without get, getting eaten alive. Mm -hmm. It was by uh, Harvey McKay. And he talked about the fact that uh, somebody asked him, when do you give up on a prospect? He said, well, it depends on which of us stops breathing first. I used to believe that. Yeah. I mean, as long as they were in my book, they're a prospect. I'm going to drip on them. I'm going to call. You're wasting time. There are a lot of people who want what you offer. So a lot of people who want what I offer. And if they don't want it, I'm not going to try to convince them. Does that make sense, Kathy? It does. It does. It made a lot of sense. And then the other thing was, did you say you had a book coming out? Well, I've got two books already. <laughs> yeah. But that's good. I'm yeah. kidding. No, books. Okay, that was good. No, humor is good. <laughs> no, book, book, books are huge. So what, what's the title of your upcoming book, Kathy? Uh, I, so I couldn't say that, to be honest, if I didn't have one upcoming. So that's number one. I couldn't lie. Well, you, um, or, well, or, or, or expand the truth. Or I'm not a writer, so I don't think I'll ever write a book, to be well, honest. You, can't. you can find ghost writers who will write in your... Well, that's what I do for blogs. So you're probably right. Actually... Yeah, no, but... Yeah. Come up with that title, but here's the thing. When you make it public and you tell people I got a book coming out, oh my gosh, every time somebody sees you, hey, how's that book coming along? Yeah, how's and I got to tell you, I got two on my shelf that you can just put your name on. I'm an agent, so that's what they do. You just put your name, they change a few words, boom, you got oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, credi it's credibility. I know. Yeah, that's what you want to be honest, so, so write one. Yeah. yeah. It's like blogging. You'll, you'll learn something as you write it. Okay, well, thank you. Any, any anyone can have a question or want to give us their why or practice their elevator speech? I just thought of my first. Uh, this is Lloyd. I just thought of my the, uh, the title of my first book. I'm already talked with John, and I and he t talks about how easy it is to write a book. I think, well, okay, maybe I could. 
I, I got one. It's, it would be, uh, I'm, I'm a retired engineer. Engineer to real estate investor in three easy steps. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Because that's going to appeal to engineers. It's going to appeal to left brain people, quite frankly. Yeah. And three, we talk about the power of three. That's excellent. Yeah. Now, sometimes yeah. in getting a book done, it's making that commitment, making it public, because people will bug you. Sometimes putting some putting some jack behind it. I've just hired a, uh, a a new editor because I've got to rewrite my books. I learned so much since I wrote them. In fact, one of the challenges I had, maybe John had it, I didn't think I was ever going to finish. I kept doing research. I oh, I didn't know that. I got to include, well, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. But put some money into it, hire a book shepherd, have somebody kick your butt, but it is huge. And what you will learn, even if you never sell the book, it's huge credibility, but the learning is in the doing. The learning is in the, so in your world, you could talk about investing in real estate, but you got to do it. Then you got stories to tell. Mm -hmm. you, know? you can read somebody else's stuff, but now you got your own stories. And when you tell those personal stories, it makes all the difference in the world. It's all about the story. And not just the stories of success. People want to hear those struggles and how you overcame them. Those are real important. I was, I was kind of amazed the other day. I always watched Donnie Brook. Ray Hartman filed for bankruptcy. Ray Hartman owned the Riverfront Times. Ray Hartman's been a, uh, had a big shot in the city forever. He just filed bankruptcy. He had made some bad real estate, <laughs> commercial real estate investments, I guess. But and he said, I owned it when I was making a lot and I, I owned it when I messed up. He'll come back. But people love to hear those stories. And that's how you talk to the people that you're trying to get to invest or do what you want to do. It, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. But I like that, you know, three engineering and real estate. Yeah, that's good. Did you guys like the idea about the, you know, I should have changed. I've got different, I got a whole bunch of different backgrounds. <laughs> but those backgrounds can be terribly distracting. You see it on television all the time. You know, what, what's in that picture? Why, why is that book there? What's that award for? And then I saw one on television, they're talking to nurses about the COVID. She had stuff that I think was probably uh, against HIPAA to have on the screen. I mean, you gotta be careful with that. But a few things will make a big, big difference. And that's how you're all dealing with prospects and clients now. So you wanna look good, look professional, and invest in a little bit like that and you probably don't want people seeing your private stuff anyway <laughs> so, uh what other questions or anybody got a good story about elevator speeches or speeches or anything else you want to share great points yeah, fred yeah jim heiser here um like lloyd i'm a retired electrical engineer and, uh, you engineer? <laughs> we got a lot of engineers in our group, especially on the board. Good. Uh, but, you know, as, as I developed in my own company, in the company I, I belong to, uh, as, I, as I became a, a director, I had to do presentations quite a bit to win work. Uh, and it would usually be three or four of us uh, engineers, architects in a team going after a large project. And we would have usually 45 minutes to an hour to present to a group of uh, people that would review and accept us over the other three firms that were trying to tell them how great we are, you know, that they are. The most stress out of everything I did in my 43 years there, doing these presentations was the most stressful for me. Uh, I, as my wife said, I could talk for hours if I just didn't have to be precise and to the point, but we each had like five minutes a piece or 10 minutes a piece to say our thing. And the problem was if, if I was the first guy or second guy on the list out of the four and I rambled on an extra five minutes, the last guy or gal, they're in trouble. They don't, because at 45 minutes, they'd cut it off. Mm. And to me, that was always the most stressful about presentations was that that time you were, were given and you had to stick to it. I mean, we would practice these things where by, you know, you'd be down to, you give a five minute speech and boy, you had to be there plus That's or minus. That's really 10 tough. Seconds. And, and, and team presentations are tough because it's like kids on a project. I may have done my job and I'm not sure you guys did. 
And that's really, really tough. Uh, let me mention this too about the, there's something called the law of primacy and recency. If you are in a group giving presentations, you want to be first or last. The, an audience best remembers the first and last things you say and do. That's why you want a strong opening, but a stronger closing. And the same thing goes for positions when you're going to speak. If you have a choice, be last. Of course, you don't want to be last right after lunch. You don't want to come in after lunch, but before lunch would be okay. But that little bit, little bitty things make a big difference in, in your world and in this world too. Uh, now, let me ask you about your presentations. Uh, did you notice anything different about the one I did? I'll, I'll just mention it. It's images, images rather than text. This is about the only text you see. And a lot of times people use bullet points. Bullet points kill, kill the bullet points. Nobody comes to read your presentation. And if you have high quality images and you speak to that image, it's a lot easier to do. You can be conversational. I have no other notes in front of me. I see what the screen has. If I'm, you know, if I had two monitors, I've got some notes, but I look at the presentation. I know what that picture is. I know what I got to talk about. And, and if I miss something, I'm not going to tell you. I just go over it. You know? Fred, uh, but, yes. Can I make a comment on that? Sure. Um, since you're taking questions, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you, but no, you know, you're saying to use bullet points. I've in the past oh, years, in, no. the, in the past year, I started presenting or teaching short sales, as most people on here know. And I am an engineer like uh, the rest of us on here, you know, thumbs up engineer part. Um, so I'm very detailed oriented. So on my slides, I do put um, a lot of detail. Um, if I put bullet points, people have a tendency to want me to keep repeating it so they could write it down. So when I put it on slides and they get the slides and then they don't have to take notes. So I struggle with that because I, I, have a, I could put just a dot in the middle of the screen and talk for two hours on short sales. I don't need anything on the screen, but then people want to know all the details of what I'm saying verbally. So that's why I incorrectly, as you're saying, I'm typing it onto the slide so, so people have well, it. Well, here's you're, the problem. You're saying not to do that. I'm reading here. You're, you're reading. No, you're reading here. I'm reading here because we read, read quicker than you speak. And there's a disconnect. Okay. You know, put the image in. And here's the reason to use images too. Another reason, and thanks for asking. Uh, we have three learning styles. Most of us are visual learners. 65% of us are visual learners. 35% are auditory, learn by listening. And the others are kinesthetic. I've, I've got a good friend. If he were here, he'd fill a ring with paper. Yeah, that's how he learns. He writes. So if you can combine two of those learning styles, you know, high quality image, you provide the text with your voice, that increases the odds they get it. And as far as those details that you're writing, David, I'd say I'll email those to you. Let me get your email address. Then you're getting everybody's address too. But if they're reading it, I mean, why do you have to be there? You know your stuff. You made a good point. I, I bet you and I have communicated a little bit. You're an expert. You know exactly what you're doing, but have some images. Now, when you're, when you're doing presentations, think about this. People will do more to avoid pain than seek pleasure. So the pain of losing money, the pain of not having retirement is far greater than the uh, glory of making money. And I'll give you an example, uh, a real life example. I get a physical every year and I go through the doctor sits down, we go through the test and uh, he usually says, hey, you're in great shape, Fred. See you next year. Here's your bill. I go, ooh, it's a lot of money to know I'm still feeling good. But I go one year, a few years ago, and he's looking at those tests. He goes, uh, Hmm. I said, what's wrong? He goes, hey, your blood sugar's a little high. I go, what's that? He says, uh, you're pre-diabetic. Well, I had a sister-in-law who died of diet. She had diabetes. She died of some other things, but she lost a leg, lost an eye. I went from ticked off at paying that checkup bill to open checkbook Mayo Clinic. <laughs> so people will do more to avoid pain than seek pleasure. So the pain of loss is far higher than the pleasure of making a lot of money. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's why those people, and the fear of public speaking is very prevalent, but get past that fear and speak it is so powerful. And, and when we talk about presentations and, and a lot of you are experts, but there's two, there's two components to a presentation, content and delivery. Content is your message, delivery is presenting it. Delivery surpasses content. 
You could be the world's expert in real estate, but if you can't present that in a manner that educates, entertains, and explains, they'll never get it. So I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? I appreciate that comment. Any other questions or comments? No? <laughs> okay. Well, email me and I'll, I'll send you these templates and hopefully you'll be able to implement some of these things. You know, the, the Zoom thing was driving me nuts for about a month and, and still continues to drive me nuts. But you only have that one chance to make a first impression. And this is the way we're going to be doing it for a while. I've got a lot of funny backgrounds I'll put up sometimes. I got one with clouds floating. And I say, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you from the other side. I, I don't see your name up here. I'm sure, that, I'm sure there's time. <laughs> hey, hey, Fred. Yes, sir. It's, it's David Randolph again. And I did come in a little bit late, so I do apologize. But, you know, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on the, the economy and the industry as far as uh, medium term. Are we going to... B, you think having to learn how to really have Zoom etiquette and Zoom presentation skills and even being a Zoom uh, recipient, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, like when I'm teaching the short sales on Saturdays, because that's what I have to do now, um, most of my people have a, a little pretty picture and, and I can't see their face. And I'm that's wondering good. if they're sleeping or not. Well, here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem. And, I, and I'm seeing this like one, two, three, four, five. I'm seeing six now. But I've seen screens of 25 people. Here's the problem. I'm looking. There's Kathy. There's John. There's David. You know, I'm not listening to somebody. We cannot multitask. And I would say this. I would have all the screens black and all the microphones muted. And you concentrate on me and my mess. That's why I make the screen go blank. What do you look at? Nonverbal communication surpasses verbal. And if all those pictures, even if it's just, I'd rather not have the pic picture, I'd rather have it black because people are still looking around. Let's see, who's the, who else is here? Let me click that arrow. And I'm not listening. We cannot multitask. Think of the example, I don't know if you're here, I talk about if you look at any of the cable shows and that little ticker tape comes along, if you're reading that ticker tape, you have no idea what they're talking about. And to prove it, when the commercial comes on, the ticker tape is gone. Advertisers would leave. And all the cable shows do it, and I have no idea why. It's very distracting. The rule is clean, simple, zen-like. You know, clean background, clean language that people understand. Dress clean yourself. Don't wear. I always wear the same thing. You know, you don't want to be distracting. We can only concentrate on one thing at a time. I hope that helps. And actually, it's more fun developing presentations when you have images. It's easier to do. You know, I don't know how many people try to memorize a speech. I can't. You want to be conversational. A any other questions? All right. The president's waiting for me. He wants to concede. He wants me to help him out with <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> help out with right. the vote, vote count. Vote count, yeah. <laughs> It's still kind in Georgia. Probably want to recount Pennsylvania. Yeah, but there, it, but little things make a big difference in the elevator speech and presentations. And if you can get in front of a group of prospects and give a great presentation, and they get it, that's huge. It's huge. Blog regularly. You know, always work your pro work. You know what you're doing. I work on this all the time. I'm always tweaking things. You know. All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, everyone. Thank you so much, Fred. Every every time you and you, one thing I really love about you too is you do evolve. Um, you, you're telling us what worked before, but what what you're doing now. You're not one of those guys that just writes the book and forgets about it. You're out there oh. in the game every day. You're doing what works and and think and changing with the times. And I just well, I'm always you. learning. I always tell people I graduated in the half of the class. Unlike you engineers, I graduated in the half of the class that made the top half possible. <laughs> So you can all thank me, you know. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you so much, Fred. All right. Thank thanks, you. Fred. Really appreciate it. Have a good it. evening. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, 
If uh, Fred, Fred is off there, uh, I'll go in. My name is Lloyd Allender. I'm the president, uh, current president of the St. Louis Real Estate Investors Association. And for the second half of the meeting, we got a, uh, uh, a nice panel discussion. It's uh, something we always look forward to every year. And uh, before we get started there, um, I want to, uh, we do have an election because we are a not-for-profit uh, in corporation. Uh, we are sort of the, uh, we're run by, run by our members for our members. And so every year we have a, uh, held an election uh, for the board of directors and, and officers. And last month we did had the uh, nominations um, read, and uh, this month we have the uh, the elections. So I'm going to go ahead and go ahead with the uh, handle the elections. Let's uh, know. My name is Lloyd Allender. I'm the current president uh, of the St. Louis Real Estate Investors Association, and I'm going to be conducting the uh, uh, the annual election for officers and directors uh, for 2021. At our October meeting. Uh, nominations for officers and directors of their association were heard and accepted. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if you got our newsletter, this hopefully you got it. Uh, I got mine today. Uh, you didn't, didn't know about uh, the passing of uh, Ruth um, Hollander Elliott. Uh, she passed away on the the fifth uh, of November, and uh, she was our. She's been our longtime secretary and. She's been, I consider her the matriarch of our organization. We've been in, in uh, operating since 1977 and she joined sometime in the early eighties and every meeting I've been to in the last 30 some years, she's always been up in front of the organization in some capacity. So she will really be missed. Uh, but due to, due to her, her passing uh, since uh, the last meeting, um, she was our treasurer and we, we did get uh, Jim uh, Choik uh, uh, who's a very qualified uh, member of our uh, board of directors has uh, um, stepped forward and agreed to uh, fill the position of treasurer for this next year. So the, uh, the uh, slate of, of nominations uh, now stands at uh, for the office of president, Lloyd Allender, for the office of vice president, Dan Heyman, for the office of secretary, Janet Keller, for the Office of Treasurer, Jim Choik. For the Membership Chair, Laura Lee. And the three nominees for um, General Director are uh, John Lee, Laura Jimerson, Diana Mayo. At this November meeting, we will elect the officers and directors of our association. And since there is only one, one slate that uh, came forward from nominations, uh, I now present this slate of candidates and I will accept a motion to elect them by acclamation. Do I, I shall so move. Okay, I hear Alex just so moved. Do I hear a second for this? I second the motion. Thank you, Perrin. Okay, I hear a um, motion has been made and seconded. So uh, I therefore declare uh, this slate of officers uh, approved for uh, the 2021 uh, year for the real, St. Louis Real Estate Investors Association. I thank you all. And, okay, now is it the, uh, the second main event of the evening. This is great. John, John likes to combine these multi, multi-faceted uh, events. Uh, and to, there's something, for, he's going to get something for everybody and everything. And, then, and our, for our panel, panel discussion, there's always something for everybody. So uh, let me uh, introduce first, uh, uh, go through the, uh, the panel. We have, uh, I think everybody is on here. I okay, see uh, Joan uh, Guccione, there's Joan. Uh, you wanna unmute yourself, Joan, so we can hear you? Can you unmute uh, her, John, or does she have to do that herself? How's there that? She there is. you go. There you go. Okay, good. Good, we can, we can, all I'll, right, hi everyone. There's Joan. She's been a longtime member of our, of our group and a uh, very active investor. Uh, we have Jim Heiser. He's already, we know his uh, audio is working. Unmute yourself, Jim, so you're ready. Uh, he's he's uh, disguised as uh, uh, Patricia Heiser. At our, so he had his wife. And we know when he was president, we know who did the heavy lifting in your in, in your office anyway. So it, Yeah, she's a brains. She's the brains. <laughs> We have uh, uh, Dan Heyman, our current vice president. He's been uh, serving with me for, I guess it's been the last three years, right, Dan? 
Yes, I think it's been, yeah, three years. Yes, we're good. Okay, and he's very another very active. Uh, I think he's out in West County, is most of his investments. Uh, then we have uh, Grace Waitman. I saw you on there somewhere, Grace. Yeah, hey. Hey, there she is. Yeah, yeah. Grace does our newsletter. Uh, she's been a, a member for quite a while, and uh, she puts together uh, our newsletter every month. And then uh, hey, we have a, a relatively newbie, I won't say newbie to investing, have uh, Maria Vargas. You want to unmute yourself, Maria? Hi. Yeah, there she is. And uh, uh, she's not new to investing, but she is new to investing in St. Louis. So we thought we'd get another perspective on on the St. Louis market compared to where she's been investing in the in the past. So we got invited her to, to come on board. Thank you. So um, I've previously sent out uh, a list of questions that we we're gonna be talking about. So everybody could be a little bit prepared for where we're gonna to talk, talk to. So I'm just gonna go through, uh, uh, and I'll start with Joan since uh, she's on my list here. And we'll, I'm gonna switch around the order of it for every question. So uh, start with Joan. Uh, how long have you been investing in real estate and why or how do you did you become an investor? Yeah. Well, hi. I have not written a book in in real estate, but I've written a couple books in hand therapy. So I have no credibility in real estate. No, that's not true. Um, I started in therapy right after I graduated from college. My mom got me involved and I just took her lead and I've been investing for over 30 years. So I have a, some apartments and some houses. Did that answer everything? Or? Okay, okay. And is there a certain part of the area where you uh, specialize in, uh, South County or West County or city? I mostly invest in South County. I've been taught that you wanna get stuff that's close to your house. I found that to work out best for me. I don't have anything in the city. Most of my apartments or houses are within five to six miles of where I live. That, that's, that's my goal. That's one of my goals. I'm still working on that one. So that's good. Good. Okay, uh, Jim, Jim Heiser, tell us uh, how you got started and why you invest. Why do we invest? Well, well ultimately for freedom. It's freedom to be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it and not have to worry about your next paycheck. Um, neighbor across the street back in 1982 or 80, I can't remember anymore, was having a, we were having a block party and I, we had just moved into the neighborhood and I was out there talking to him. His name was Art. And uh, I said, Art, what do you, and he was out there and I said, Art, what do you do? And he goes, uh, I said, do you work? And he goes, well, not really. And I go, what do you mean you don't work? And he goes, well, I've got real estate. That's not to say you don't have to work at it. But uh, anyway, long story short, he started telling us about uh, his rental properties and blah, blah, blah. And I came back inside afterwards. And I was talking to my wife, Pat, and I said, you know, maybe we ought to try that. That sounds kind of interesting. Back in 1982 and 80, 1980, there wasn't much on TV about all these real estate gurus like you see now. And uh, so anyway, we uh, we were lucky to find out about the St. Louis Real Estate Investors Association, became a member and been a member ever since. And, uh, you know, that's, we, that's how we got started. Our neighbor across the street told us about it. And uh, um, I don't know, did I answer your question? Same as Joan? I think so, <laughs> good question. And I know you, you said, it, we're, we might have to cut you off because I, I figured about two minutes for each question for each participant and we'll, we'll keep this close to an hour or so. <laughs> yeah, my wife says I talk too much. So Thanks for giving me that warning in your previous uh, uh, <laughs> presentation there. Okay, uh, moving on to, to Dan. Same question. Uh, how long you've been investing and how did you get started? Yeah, so I started investing in uh, 2010. I actually started looking. I, I started coming to the group about 20... 08, 20, maybe it was 2007, 2008. And prices were very, very high. Real estate was crazy high. So in 2010, I started seeing houses around me that, um, you know, obviously the prices came down a lot. And I started running the numbers and they looked really good. So um, so I started buying. So back in 2010, I, I, you know, I bought my first house and then I bought another house and another house. So uh, that's how I got started. And um, 
uh, right now, I, again, I pretty much just single family rentals, so. Okay. Okay, Grace, same question. How long have you been investing and how did you get started? Um, well, I've actually been coached by Fred, so I'm just going to say, hi, I'm Grace. Um, the title of my upcoming book is Investing with Grace Beyond Money. Um, and I got started in real estate investing. Um, well, actually, I got started because my parents took me when they sold their first house or they moved out of our first house, they rented out the second house. So they started bringing me to open houses for our rental house when I was six. Um, so, and then my parents got divorced and my dad passed away. So I inherited some. So that's how I got started. And I've been investing about 18 years. Okay. Uh, same question for Maria. Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Vargas and I've been in St. Louis all of five months. It's not even been five months just yet. So still new to this market. Um, I got started in 2006. I was 21 years old and I had just graduated from college and I got started because um, it was kind of the only way that my dad would give me a graduation gift. He had just become a licensed realtor and his whole thing was, oh, you graduated and I'm a realtor. Why don't I sell you a house? And instead of taking that commission, that's your gift. And I said, well, if that's the only way you're going to give me a gift, I'll take it. Little did I know <laughs> that I was buying the wrong asset in the wrong geography with the shittiest, if I can say that, um, financing product. And the market was going to crash soon after that. So I had quite the school uh, to go through. So I've been investing now for about 14 years. But as you guys can imagine, um, I got myself into quite a little bit of trouble with my first deal, and that really taught me a lot. Um, I ended up recovering from that. It took years, and so I've been hardcore investing in the last four years. And in these last four years, I've, I've done quite a bit, so I'm excited to tell you guys about that. Uh, why? I'm going to just say it, you guys. I think this stuff is addictive. I think we're all a bunch of addicts. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes, I'm, I'm all about financial freedom. Let's I'm proud to say that I'm scratching the surface yeah, of um, financial freedom it's right now. Um, it feels good. But at the end of the day, I think this stuff is addictive. You do one deal and then you're, you're not even dried ink on the uh, contract and you're already looking for the next thing. Yep. I understand that feeling. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, all right, with you, um, Maria, let's just go on to the second question then. Uh, uh, what is the best deal you've ever done? That, okay, yes. you only told us about your worst one, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so the best deal, I'm gonna tell you why it's the best deal. Um, it is the best deal because it was the deal that I put the least amount of money in, and it is the deal that has already paid for itself many fold and it's the deal from which cash flow I'm basically living off of today. Um, this was a house, a single family house that I purchased in Denver, Colorado. So I was just most recently in Denver, Colorado. Um, it was a big house, a um, six bed, two bath. The reason that it was the um, least acquisition is because I bought it as owner occupied with 30 year traditional financing. So I was able to get in for only 5%. Um, the asset was, uh, the purchase price was $409,000. Uh, um, but of course, 5% of that is, is something we can all uh, stomach. Um, for better or worse, I've always lived in high priced areas. So I've always had roommates. So I kind of hacked it. I brought my friends in and they were paying all the bills. Um, I'm currently cash flowing about 12 to 1400 a month from that uh, particular uh, house. Um, now the other piece of it, which I don't like to, I, I don't consider this as much in my buying criteria, but appreciation obviously is one of the ways that we make money in, in uh, real estate. So in the short time that I've owned that asset, it's been about uh, 20 months that I've owned that asset, it's appreciated at least $100,000. Oh. 
So pretty oh, good yeah. one there. I can believe that with the way the market's been here in the last uh, last year. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, moving on to Grace. Um, what was your best deal, the best, best deal you've ever done? Oh, um, well, it's probably, I guess, the easiest deal, and it's um, one I currently hold, but um, it was, um, I, I'm on a wholesaler's list, and so I found out about this property. I was actually searching for a property for my mother to move to St. Louis, and so um, I went and looked at it, and I was like, well, I'll put in an offer on it, and then I wasn't sure about it, but then I got a private lender from it, which was kind of amazing. It just kind of fell into my lap and I was very grateful for that. And then um, the um, the purchase price compared to ARV was about 45%. So that was like the easiest deal. And I, I wasn't even sure I was gonna go look at it because like the showing was like just one hour and it was kind of earlier in the morning. And I was like, well, I'll just go. And then I just kind of stumbled upon it. So, I um, mean, it wasn't like, it didn't have any foundational issues. It was all cosmetic um, repairs. So that's been my easiest deal to date. Yeah. Good, good. Dan, moving back to Dan. Uh, what's been your uh, best deal today? Yeah, well, my, uh, my best deal would actually occurred. I purchased a, a home in uh, Creve Core uh, back in 2011. And um, it is just, and I got a steal of a price. It was a foreclosure. And um, that house now is worth double what I paid for it. So, um, yeah, so. That was my, that is my, I still own it today, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to get rid of those good, good deals when they just keep uh, increasing in value. They keep paying you every day. Good, yeah, you know, bought, you know, bought in a great area. It's a fabulous area. Sure. Great school district and just keeps on going up. Yep. Okay, Jim, tell us about your, your best deal. Yeah, I'd first tell you about my worst deal. And I don't want to normally do this, but it, it's a segue into what's the best deal. Well, that's the next question. But if you want to cover them both, I'll give you I'll give you two uh, extra minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, a number of years ago, I, this may have been around 2008 or earlier, uh, Grantwood Village over there in South County area of St. Louis. My wife and I bought a house off a gentleman and we thought we had a great deal going. It was a beautiful house, very nice uh, neighborhood. Uh, so we fixed it up, we rehabbed it and we tried to start selling it. I, I forgot how much we put into it, maybe 50,000. I don't remember. And, uh, the problem was we couldn't get any takers for what we were asking for it. And we had checked comps and what have you. Well, what we came to find out was it had a basement, uh, a, a, um, garage in the basement where you drove around to the back of the house and you had to drive into park in the basement, which was okay. But at that point in time, SUVs were really the thing to buy. And um, everybody was buying them. This house was built in the 50s for the station wagon. So you had a very short ceiling. You could not drive an SUV in there, especially if you had a garage door open. And that sounds very minute reason. The other part though was then when you parked in the garage with your groceries, you had to go walk to the other side of the basement to get up, walk up the steps to get to the kitchen. So those two things we did not see as a problem, did not catch it when we bought it. Everything else was beautiful about the house and the neighborhood. We lost $40,000 on that house. That's the only time we ever lost money. A couple of weeks later, a person up the street passed away and uh, long story short, the uh, relatives contacted me this is on my own street and we ended up buying that house. And immediately I made over 40,000 in equity just by buying it. So lost 40,000, made 40,000. So, and that's the only time we ever lost money. And normally, you know, in all the years we've been doing this and we've probably done, I don't know, 40 plus rehabs and, and flips and all that. Uh, but, you know, we did okay. So that's my story. Okay. Well, at least, yeah. Generally, once you, you get one bad deal, if you keep if you keep at it, yeah. you'll more than pay for it. You know, you turn around. You, just, you can't stop with that one. You gotta. gotta That's keep. right. And again, this was the only time we ever lost any money in all the properties we've done over the years, and uh, it was a learning experience for us. God knows we would never thought that would have been an issue with the house, 
we have been, you know, doing properties for 20 years plus years already. And we, we thought we knew everything. Well, we did it. Mm -hmm. Okay. On to, back to Joan. Uh, what was your best deal? I would have to say my best deal was probably the first purchase I made. Got my feet wet. I got into the program. I started experiencing what it was like to be a landlord. And I had the support of the group. I was a member from the beginning. So I think the first deal. I think my most creative deal, though, just came recently where I'm learning what my exit strategy is. And it's not as easy as you would think to get out of real estate. So I talked to Jim, I talked to Pat, I talked to Dave, I talked to Diane, I talked to Ruth, I talked to so many members and they came up with and they sold me on the idea of how to minimize capital gains and how to uh, save on taxes, possibly do an installment sale, um, doing a for sale by owner. So this is my most creative and I'm actually closing on my first house uh, that I'll be selling in the 30th of November. So great, great. Yeah, that's a lot of things to us uh, addicts like uh, Maria says us addicts are looking at uh, uh, our acquisitions and not, not necessarily thinking about our exit strategy, which is a good thing we we should be thinking about it when you ever we get into a property thinking about where our what is probably more than one exit strategy too. a couple and of I didn't want to do a lifetime exchange. I want to get out. If you want to get out, you want to get out. Yeah. So that's, and there are, you know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of possibilities for getting out. So uh, I'm glad you uh, consulted. And that's one of the th great things about this group. There's a lot of people you can talk to and, and who have been down that road and, uh, and uh, uh, can give you some advice. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, that was your best. Okay. Uh, while we're with you, uh, you, you want to tell us about your worst or have you not had any of those? Uh, I bought a timeshare. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. that is painful. I... Yeah. Oh, God. I'm not alone, maybe. <laughs> yeah. That, I would say, uh, was my worst purchase. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I worked through it. You worked through it, huh? So you get you got out of it or you're still working through no, it? No, I paid it off. I paid it off and... I'm out of it now. So yeah, that I would have to say was the worst. The other thing about landlording, as many of you know, is the tenant failures. You know, that's that's another worst that if you don't get the right person in there, you're not gonna you're not gonna enjoy answering the phone. You're not gonna wanna go do the work. It just makes it so much more difficult to uh and I've actually asked tenants to leave while they were in contract. I said, we're just not gonna get along. Um, I'd appreciate it if you just leave. One of them, I paid him for one of the storage units. Might have cost me a couple hundred bucks, but I knew in the long run that was the best, the best uh, situation for our relationship. Oh yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, that's that's why you've been a long-term uh, uh, landlord. Uh, when you, once you learn that it's in the tenant selection, and if you can't get along with the folks, and they're not going to work with you. Better, you're better to cut your, cut your losses. Yeah. you much rather, most of us that are in, in this business would say we'd rather have a vacant unit and we can find a good tenant than have a unit that's occupied with a tenant we want to get rid of. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, 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 a, that's a big lesson in this business. So. But if you do it right, you will not have that many issues with tenants. And it's that's all right. in the screening. So mm -hmm. don't yeah. let that newbies get scared about mm -hmm. tenants. If you do the proper selection, beforehand you won't have that many issues yeah i think that's one of the things i get asked a lot of people when they find out i'm like oh what do you how do you deal with those tents you know i had i knew somebody that had and they had tenant problems and I said, well, who rented to those folks who selected those people to move into their house so you do you make your make your choices up front when you move people in and that that, that saves all the headaches and in these two incidences they look good on paper and they qualify. The personalities were just overbearing. Mm -hmm. they demands that I wasn't comfortable doing. And I knew that they would always try and get more than 
what I was willing to to say was going to work or be appropriate. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I know. Just in when I've shown in some of my houses, uh, just when I just got some vi vibes from some folks that I probably knew they weren't going to qualify to start with, and and I, I use a professional screening company, so and they, they use they usually give me some kind of an excuse why there's something in the background. So uh, that's that's good. Okay, uh, okay, Jim, you, you're, you're finished with your your bad deal and your good one. I think so. Okay, I, mean, I can tell you about other good ones, but not not many bad ones at all. Okay, and then uh, Dan, you want to tell us about one of your worst deal you've ever done? I, I actually purchased a home on a motion. So uh, one, uh, I had a house that I, I thought I loved. I fell in love with it. And that, mm. that was a mistake. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that one didn't, I mean, yeah, I still own it today. And it's actually, I'll, I'll probably do sell it. I'll make money, but, you know, yeah, I definitely bought it too high. Yeah, well, that's the thing with real estate, though. Even if your mistakes, you hold them long enough. If you can, you know, suffer long enough, you'll make it up. Yeah, yeah, time eventually cures. Time does. Okay, uh, then Grace, have you yeah. had a bad deal you want to talk to and share with? Yeah, sure. Um, it was one of my earliest ones. So when I first inherited a house, it was located in my hometown in southern Indiana, and I was going to school 120 miles away. But there was a tenant who had been living there um, when I inherited it. And I was like, okay. So then her mom passed away, and she got left the house in Indianapolis, which was like 200 miles away from the apartment where she was renting. And so one day she get, she called me and she's like, um, we've got a problem because she had a friend who had been looking in on the apartment while she was trying to figure out what she was going to do. And I was like, okay. And she's like, it's raining in the garage. And I was like, it's raining in the garage. And so she had somehow, it was winter. She had left the um, heat off in her apartment. The pipes of her, because her apartment was above the garage, the pipes had frozen and her friend only checked the apartment every few days. And by the time she came back from one time to the other, she's like, she peered in through the windows of the garage door and she was like, it's raining inside the garage. And I was like, oh. So I had a friend go over and check it for me. And then I called the insurance company. And so a $15,000 claim later, we got it sorted out. And I was like, oh, this is what landlording is like. So it was a very interesting um, entrance into the world of it. I almost was like, should I sell this? And I was like, no, I can survive raining in the garage. Now, if it's been snowing in the garage, maybe not, but raining, I was like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, that that is not too well. That's not too subtle. I've I've had one of those experiences. Fortunately, only one in my in my life that have had uh, rain in a downstairs apartment. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. Um. Okay. Um. Maria, I hope you haven't had too many bad experiences. <laughs> Here's about one. No, positive. And, and I tell you, I, I tend to be one of those people that always looks for, you know, what can I learn out of this? And, and that's what I will say about my worst deal. Um, when I introduced myself, I talked a little bit about how my first deal was kind of the, the most challenging deal. Um, like I said, wrong asset, wrong geography, wrong time, wrong everything. I mean, exhibit A of the 2008 crash. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, and, and for anyone that's newer or going through a difficult situation, bad deals, bad situations are the ones that we learn the most from. I have to say from that first deal where everything that could have gone wrong went wrong, I came out so much stronger. I came out um, with resilience, with persistence. And the biggest lesson that I took away was not to get myself into stuff that I didn't understand. And so in order to move forward, I knew that it was going to be critical for me to surround myself with the right people. One of the goals that, that I have for myself is to be the least accomplished person in the room. Um, and so that really speaks to, you know, why I, I value groups like this too, uh, because whenever you just are going through a bad situation or you don't know what to do, it makes the world of difference to be able to turn to a community you're a part of and say, hey, guys, this is a situation. Has anyone dealt with this? And, and what would you do? Um, so my worst deal, I think, was a huge blessing because of the mindset that it created for me. 
Yeah, that's something. Yeah, if you get get off to a bad start sometime, that, that can be a, a roadblock. But uh, I'm glad you you figured out that that's a learning experience. I've learned found that too. Yeah, the, my I, my worst experience. I I learned from it, and I haven't made that mistake again. So. Uh, and I, I don't yeah, think the, the good experiences, we just don't really learn that much. You know, we kind of pat ourselves in the back and we're like, oh, look at me, I'm so good. <laughs> or I'm getting the hang of it. And and I, I think uh, Jim had made this point earlier. Um, sometimes we take those good experiences kind of for granted because we kind of feel like we now know how it goes. Um, so anytime that a challenge comes my way, I'm just always looking for what can I learn out of this? That's the way to, that's the only way to look at it. In fact, John, John wrote a, John Lee wrote a book about uh, learning from his uh, bad deals. <laughs> um, okay, well, while we're with you, um, if you were starting over today, uh, what would you do, do differently, Maria? Well. Well, other than your bad, I guess your bad. <laughs> I think you kind of talked about it in your life. I, I feel like I'm having a start over here in St. Louis, and it has been very challenging here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I came to St. Louis to build a rental portfolio. I purchased a property. I purchased it well, so I've got some margin for error. Um, but I will say that I have already exhausted that margin for error on that particular deal. Now I know it's going to be something I can make up in, in the hold of it. Um, but what I would do differently, um, and this is, you know, in sort of my, my St. Louis experience, is I utilized all my own money in St. Louis, um, which on the positive side, I don't have a hard lender or a private lender or anyone kind of over my shoulder, which creates that much more stress. But the bad side, and, and this is really for me, a huge cost, a huge opportunity cost, is that all my money is tied in this one deal and I can't really do that much more. Um, so I'm kind of stuck seeing this through completion, getting into a refi after, I'm trying to do the whole Burr strategy on this one. Um, so what I would do differently is I would finance, leverage, not put all of my money into this one deal like I did, but it was a new market. I wanted to have a little bit of insulation. I didn't want to have that stress of working with someone else's money in a new market, uh, but I'm paying for it. You're paying for it, yeah. But once you get that first one and do it uh, and refinance, that should be a little relief. <sighs> yeah. Okay, then we jump back to uh, Grace. If you had to start over today, what would you do differently? Um, I would probably start um, educating myself about, I would start reading more um, about um, things like property managers, um, landlording, screening tenants, and then I might have gone the route of lease options as opposed to rentals. Um, and I probably would have joined Bigger Pockets and Red Ridge Dad a lot earlier than I actually did because I think mindset and education is so critical. And sometimes you just accept what someone's telling you if you're like, I'm just sort of in this situation and you try to learn. But then if you don't have the best team working with you, especially if you're ever trying to manage rentals from um, a distance, then um, you just kind of have to trust people. And like I had other resources to have boots on the ground to check things out. But if I just read a bit more and understood a bit more about the investing mindset, I think I would have done, I would have changed the way I did some stuff. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Um, Dan, what would you do differently if you had to start over? Yeah, I got a couple. A couple items that I would do. First is when I when I first started, I really didn't have a why. You know, why am I doing this? I just sort of looked at it and said, "Oh yeah, this looks interesting." Uh, you know, the, the prices are down. I really didn't have a why. So it, it, um, when I hit fifty, is when my why became pretty clear. So at at fifty, I um, I, I made a goal of being able to. Yeah. Um, retire at by 55. So that became my why. I wanted financial freedom. I wanted to just get out of, you know, I want to get off the treadmill, get out of the rat race. 
So by 55, I wanted to be out. So that, that again, I think everybody who gets started needs to kind of think about what is their why? why? Why are you doing this? You just, you know, it just can't be for making money. There has to be a why, you know? So, um, so yeah, so, so by when I hit 50, I became clear what my why was. The second thing is if there ever is a time again where uh, real estate goes on sale. So if you ever, if I'm, all the new people, all the younger folks, if real estate ever goes on sale again, you, you might get maybe one time in your life, maybe if you're lucky, maybe maybe two, where every, either, where people just don't want to buy real estate. And, re, and again, like in 2007 through, you know, through two, 2009, uh, real estate actually went down. So if real estate ever goes down, jump. So when there's blood in the streets, start. <laughs> so that, you know, those are the two things that I would do differently. You know, I was slow, you know, uh, I would be, again, if I was starting going backwards, I would have bought a lot more properties. I would have, um, during that time frame. Yeah, that's, that's good. Good, uh, good input there is it need, you need to have a why and uh, you, like I said, you figured it out. Good. Um, Jim, I think you were, you started out telling us why, but uh, you got anything more to add to that, Jim? Yeah, my battery's running low. Well, your battery's on low. Plug in. Well, Try it out. That, that's what my wife's doing right at the moment. Well, you know, that just yeah, popped I, I never, up. You, you could not <laughs> ring without that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Go ahead. I, uh, I want to say about Maria, Maria, you got a great future because you could have get, given up with the real estate after that first deal. Instead, you did the exact opposite. So you're a winner. You'll do fine. You know, you'll I, do I didn't fine. tell you guys about all the crying that happened in between. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, what was I going to say? I got lost, lost my train of thought. Um, would we do something differently? You know, I, Pat's sitting right next to me. We keep on thinking, what the, what the hell would we do differently? And we must be, I don't know. We're saying, I don't know what we would have done differently. We, we've been successful at it. We like what we did. Uh, maybe I would not have done so much hands-on work, but I think a number of you have heard this before. As a nerdy engineer, I love working on these properties. I love fixing them up. Uh, I'm retired now, and I'm working on my son's properties, you know, six days a week. Um, I just, I just like to see them develop and grow and, and figure out the things that are wrong with them and fix them and, and get my hands on them. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, honestly, we're having a hard time figuring out what we would, would have done differently. What, what, what we did do in order to develop our real estate, um, career was we, we would find a house, maybe $60,000. Okay. We'd pay for it. And what we would do is we would borrow equity in our house, second line of credit, and we would also borrow on our 401k. Now, this is going back in the 80s. We put that money, that cash together. We would buy the house for 60000 Somehow, we'd come up with, with another 20000 big borrow or steal. We have 80000 in it, free and clear. Then we'd go to the bank. They would give us 80% you know, loan to value. And so we would get $80,000 back out of it. We had 80,000 in it and we put somebody in there, the rent. And so they start paying our mortgage. So at first, the first number of years, we didn't make nothing. We had zero coming in, but we had zero going out. You know, I get my $80,000 back and we would do it again. Now, once in a while, we'd leave five or 10,000 in it as the years went on but we were basically doing no money down deals. So if you have the ability to borrow on your 401k uh, or if you can borrow from Aunt Mabel or whatever, uh, within reason, uh, you, could, you could still do that, I would think. Now, we've slowed down over the years. We don't buy like we used to, but that's how we developed uh, our, our portfolio. Plus I did a lot of sweat equity. I won't, I won't lie to you. Um, that was just in my nature to do that, but you know, that's, that's how we did it. And we're looking at each other here and thinking, what would we have done differently? You know, I, I wish I could tell you, uh, I probably would have liked to have been a little bit smarter or maybe not have 
work some of those long hours, you know, guys like Dave Randolph, you know, they know how to do it right, you know, but that's our story. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Joan, uh, would you do anything differently if you had to start over? Uh, if I had to start over, I, uh, I like what's going on with the market now that people are investing through their Roth IRA. And I think that would be a way to go mm -hmm. that I'd like to do differently. So yeah. otherwise I think investing is great. It's a, I, I've enjoyed investing. Um, I did like Dan did when the housing market crashed. I bought up houses then, you know, I set a goal for myself to a year. For five years and I bought 10 houses in those five years you could have bought 40 a day if you wanted to there were so many houses yeah. but um, I just didn't want to bite off more than I could chew so I just I was comfortable with two and I have 10 of them now and I've been sitting on them for a few years and so I think uh yeah just uh invest people need you try and get out there and see what you're comfortable with uh, yeah, that's one thing with the uh, um, the Roth IRAs and the uh, self-directed IRA options that, that there are out there today with all the trust trust companies. Uh, there's a lot more options for for financing finding some of those deals than than there used to be. I, I just realized what we should have done differently. It's a oh, Roth. So that right. I will agree <laughs> with that. Yeah, I had a head of, head of Joan. Joan reminded you of that, huh? Yeah. yeah. Or Jim, maybe get your place in Florida a little bit earlier. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, we're going there next week. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, while we're on, Joan, uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, why do you continue to invest in real estate? Well, I'm not investing anymore. You didn't invest anymore, but you're not selling everything you got, though, right? Uh, no, I'm slowly thinking of, I'm slowly going to start selling, though. Okay. So, yeah, I am. I, I liked buying homes. Like Maria had said, it's an addiction. I was good at buying homes. You know, somebody said, you buy homes like I buy clothes. <laughs> you know, I felt comfortable doing it. Um, I knew it was going to give me financial freedom. So, so yeah, but uh, currently I'm not going to invest anymore. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, back to, back to Jim. Um, why do you, why are you, are, are you continuing to invest or you're, uh, you're in that hold mode right now? Well, you know, for, for all the newbies out there, you get to a certain age and you start realizing do you need another X amount of houses to, to do what, you know? Uh, so we, we've gotten to a point where we've really haven't bought recently. We're looking at one now. I mean, if the deal is really, really good, We'll, we'll still do it, but there comes a point in your life after you've done all this stuff, you want to start having more fun. I'm, you know, I retired from my regular job and you want to start, you know, goofing off a little bit, to put it bluntly. Uh, and right now I'm still working my butt off for my son in, in his properties, but I'm doing it at my pace. What I don't get done today, I work on tomorrow but you do have a different mindset when you realize you got X amount of years left that you can do whatever physically and emotionally and blah, blah, blah. And so you start backing off, at least most people do, and they want to start enjoying it. Uh, case in point, Joan, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so there's nothing wrong with Joan saying, Hey, I, I want to start selling. So for the newbies out there that let's say you're in your twenties or your thirties, that's a different mindset than when you're in your 60s, you know, or whatever, you know. So there's nothing wrong with that. But the point is, you're at the, the point in your life where you don't have to worry whether Medicare is going to get that check to you every a month uh, or, you know, or to some extent what happens with the stock market. That, that house is not going to drop 50% in value unless you're in living in California. But here in old St. Louis, Maria, it's not going to drop 50%. Okay. I'll tell you that right now. So. Okay. Um, Dan, why do you continue to invest in real estate? Or do you? 
So, so one of the things with, um, as everybody knows, the, the government is printing lots and lots of money. So um, long term, you, you got to have some of your assets in real estate. I mean, uh, so so that's why I'm going to continue investing. I'm, I'm, I'm again, I'm approaching that age where I'm slowing down. Um, you know, I, I want I want to enjoy myself more. So. I'm not buying like I used to, but, um, but yeah, just like Jim had said that if there's a good deal, if there's a good deal that came up, I know I got some really good equity in it. Uh, I'll take it. Uh, I am looking for a property for my daughter still. Uh, if anybody has a property in Richmond Heights that isn't outrageous, I'll, I'll buy it cash. Um, so, um, Again, I'm looking for, you know, for me, it's just, I'm looking for instant equity or right now for my daughter. So, um, and again, the reason why is because I know that, you know, the government is printing money. Uh, cash is not king right now. Uh, bonds are, are long-term bond, you know, in terms of bonds, where bonds are at basically at 0%, you're not gonna make any money. So basically you have really only two choices. That I well, actually, three choices you have stocks, you have real estate, and you have gold. So, that basically is, is how I at least how I look at it. And that's in terms of my new investing, in terms of new money, that's that's what I'm doing. So, okay, thank you. How about uh, Grace? Why, why are you continuing to invest? Um, that's a great question, and um. I also thought of something else I would do um, differently, but, and they're kind of wrapped up together. Um, one other thing I would do differently is to have a bit of a more definitive plan. And that kind of wraps up into my why, because I literally just kind of fell into it. And I, it'd been something that had been part of my life, my, my whole life. So I was used to it. Um, and I didn't realize there was a way of doing it other than what my parents did. So, but that's also part of why I continue to invest and why I love investing and what all the knowledge that I've gained from finding out the different ways to um, invest in real estate. Cause I actually, I mean, I teach full time at WashU. I love my job. I would never quit it. Um, at the same time, I've also always had a flexibility of schedule um, that I think you can't find in a lot of nine to fives. And my dad was an English professor. So I kind of growing up, I kind of just thought that was a thing, even though I saw my friend's parents working, you know, nine to five. But then when I look at my husband, he works a traditional nine to five. And so I'm like, um, there's something to be able to kind of direct how you have your own time. You know, you don't have to go to the grocery store when it's really busy, things like that. So I think that real estate investing is a way to a different kind of life. You know, um, all my, my parents knew about it, like rentals, but they didn't have the like alternative mindset. So I like, like we've been talking about, you know, self-directed IRAs, especially Roth IRAs, but um, like, you know, I, my stocks are different. My broker controls those. And I could try to learn enough about the market to try to do you know, my own day trading, but real estate I know about, it's a physical thing. I've always liked houses. My parents kind of trained me. How do you look at houses? How do you, know, how do you examine them? I love architecture. So does my husband. So it's like, there aren't any limits other than what you place on yourself. Um, it's a kind of investing that's unparalleled in the types of options that you can do and the kind of money that you can make. Um, my doctoral studies are in creativity. So I love creativity. And so um, it's like I can fully apply my creative approaches to real estate investing in, in like so many different areas. And so it, it's kind of like, it, it's addiction. It's an addiction, just like Maria said. So, and it kind of goes along with my, my regular job as well. So yeah, for sure. Okay, yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Maria, um, right. why do you continue to invest? Well, I think Dan really said it best, you know, hedging against inflation is real estate is the asset to absolutely hedge against inflation. And by the way, no one has said tax benefits. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that's when taxes do become sexy um, when you when you own real estate. So that's nice. Um, but along the same lines of what my my other uh, fellow panelists have said, financial freedom, you know, and I kind of want to turn this idea that a couple of you have uh, uh, talked about. I think uh, Grace and I sort of exemplify maybe the the younger uh, folks on on this path. 
I would agree with what Jim said of there, you get to a certain age where you just want to do more with your free time. And at 36 years old, I'm already there. <laughs> yeah. So Dan, you and I have a, a very similar plan to uh, graduate from the rat race within five years or less. Um, that's why I continue to do it. You know, I'm hedging against inflation. I'm taking advantage of the, um, the tax uh, code. I'm able to enjoy time doing what I want to do. Uh, I'm going to be, for example, uh, going skiing for about five weeks um, come late December. Of course, COVID dependent. Um, God damn you, COVID messing with my financial freedom plans here. Um, but absolutely, you know, it's just one of those things that once you start seeing the results, and, and like right now I'm living off of cash flow from investments I've made already. You can't, you can't beat that. You know, when I talk to my girlfriends and people that I grew up with and they're telling me about their job and their job search and all that, I just, I couldn't be any more bored. <laughs> so, and, and I, I'm, I'm here to confess that I don't love houses. I don't love design. Um, I love spreadsheets. I love analyzing deals. I love talking numbers and I love money working for me, not me working for money. There you go. That's a good strategy. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to the, uh, the sixth question. Uh, what advice, do you have some advice you'd give to a new investor? Maria, I'm gonna start with you, Can you? You know, I'm gonna echo what, what Grace said earlier educating yourself. There's so many resources that are free and available for you to educate yourself. I love bigger pockets as a starting point. YouTube is fantastic. I mean, anything you want to know about is there. Um, but the biggest advice I would have for someone is don't get stuck on just the education. You've got to take action and getting started only takes getting started. So do educate yourself, do read, but do take action. Very good. Yeah, that's good advice. You can educate yourself forever. And we have some some folks that are had gotten in that rut, you know, and never gotten started investing. So I know I know some folks like that. So it's yeah. good. Very good advice. Uh, Grace, you want to uh, pick up on that? Uh, any advice that you would give to new investors? Yeah, for sure. Um, there's like, I, I'm echoing what Maria said, but um, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's life changing. It's like, ridiculously life-changing um get on bigger pockets post things ask questions um talk to our club everyone here is so nice they're so helpful they're so knowledgeable it's, it's ridiculous and like amazing um you know ask an investor if you can shadow them to like look at deals um look at a rehab take an investor to lunch you know for 12 bucks well i mean during COVID, I mean, maybe an outdoor lunch um, with one of those restaurants that have like heaters, you know, when they, when they, when you can eat in, in the county. Anyway, you know, go to a park with takeout, I guess, you know, but take an investor to lunch and just pick their brain. Um, make friends who do this. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I don't know if that's exclusively true, but when you have friends who do this and you can like text someone um, or call them and pick up the phone, that's so helpful and amazing especially friends that are supportive um find what type of real estate you like and you're comfortable with are you a wholesaler do you like rentals do you like rehab what do you like to do um and then one of the most important things is don't ever think you failed um, maria said that you know her first deal was nightmare um the rating in the garage i was like uh you know I, i'm used to just needing an umbrella and a raincoat so i mean um we've got google Google is like an amazing thing. You can find answers to almost anything you need. Don't ever think you failed. Don't ever think that you've done something that's so irreparable. You can't keep going. You know, there you can, you can, tomorrow is always a new day, fresh with no mistakes. That's a quote from one of my favorite books. So just keep at it. Um, persistence is so important. So, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Dan, um, what, what advice would you, would you give to a new investor today? If I was to give advice to a new investor, I'd say start early. You know, the earlier you start, the better. If you can start in your 20s, uh, that's the best. Because um, time, you know, uh, basically, you know, to have tenants pay for your properties. You know, once you, if, if you get a handful of properties, you know, you get 
five or six properties paid for and you're in your 50s, uh, you're, you're pretty much set. You know what I'm saying? If, you're in a, if you have five good properties in a good area paid for, uh, uh, that's the best cash flowing. You know, that's, that's where you're going to get your cash flow when, when things are paid for. So um, start early. Yep. Very good. Very good advice. Uh, yeah, Jim. Any what what's your? Well, your I would echo what uh, Dan said. If you start in your twenties, and even if you get thirty, if you have to get thirty-year loans on them, by the time you're in your fifties, <clears throat> excuse me, you got a number of them paid off. Uh, you're looking pretty. You don't have to work till you're sixty-five. And and all you youngins out there, there's not going to be any retirement. You're going to have to work till you're a hundred. Okay, and pay for all this money we're spending right now. So uh, I think the other advice I would, would give is uh, uh, join a real estate investment group like ours. And the reason is you can talk to people like ourselves who've been through the school of hard knocks and we can give you guidance and advice. That's what happened with me. Ruth uh, Hollander was a, a big help to Pat and I when we first got started. And there was other people who since passed on, but Back then, uh, and I went to a board meeting and I said, we're new. And the 10 other board members threw their cards down and said, call me anytime, you know. Um, but, you know, us seasoned people have gone through this and we can help you out. And once, especially once we get back into regular meetings where you can talk face to face to them, it's not that you can't call now, but uh, it's gonna be so much easier to sit down or, you know, at the meetings uh, bring your problem and we can talk about it and you can talk with three or four, a, a lot of different seasoned investors that can help you out. Uh, another thing is, um, is uh, I, we, we pattern a lot of our buying uh, single family homes on John Schaub. I'd recommend him. He's got, uh, uh, what's that one, Pat? Uh, making it big on one little one house, deal, one house at a time. He's got a number of books out, John Schaub really good, but he's a guy that, you know, recommends just buying a lot of houses and holding them, what have you. Now, again, for you, you people out there, maybe you starting out, you just want to buy and flip uh, to get some money or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that versus uh, buying and holding, you know, so you don't have to be a landlord. You could be a wholesaler, a flipper, whatever. Uh, and you got to, by coming to the club, you can meet these different type of people that do these different type of uh, venues, you know, so um, but the biggest thing is having somebody you can call and talk to who can help you with finding a good attorney, a good plumber, a new, good electrician, uh, a good architect, a good rehabber, you know, these will all come into play, uh, but you got to get this network going. And then you got your handful of people you can talk to when you have a problem because you will have problems, but if you have the right people you can talk to, you will succeed. Uh, one other thing, um, I was uh, wanting to get one of my chimneys tuck pointed and I wanted to get it done this year before uh, the weather got bad. So I have this one fellow who owns his own company. He said, yeah, I can do it. It'd be a thousand bucks, but I can't do it till next, next year, you know, in, in April or May. Well, I needed to get, I wanted to get it done sooner. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you can do it for me now, yet this year, I'll sit down with you, my wife and I, and we'll tell you everything you wanted to know about real estate and how to get started, blah, 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 because he wanted to get into real estate. He said, oh, I'm so busy. I just can't do it. Now, <laughs> he made a big mistake. He made a real big mistake because we could have downloaded so much information to him. I would have told him everything he needed to know and more, and I would have always been there for him. But he didn't want to take the time, one hour, whatever, to talk to us because he was too busy in his nine to five job. Mm -hmm. Instead of buying real estate where he would be making money nine to nine to nine to nine every hour of the day. So that's my two minute speech. Okay. Thank you, Jim. And on to, to Joan, uh, what advice would you give to a new investor today? I spoke three, five minutes. Well, we've heard so many success stories and so many failure stories. Um, and I think even the people that haven't spoke, we all have failure stories. Our worst stories probably haven't come yet. So um, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Mistakes are going to happen. 
um, I have a quote that I have on my computer. It says, tough times never last, but tough people do. So you'll always come into harder times or you have to somehow overcome. Don't let these tenants get to you. Um, set goals for yourself. I like to set goals. Uh, I find that it's a reward for myself when I obtain or achieve the goal. So. Okay, very good. And then let's, uh, while, while we're with you, Joan, last question. How does uh, membership in the uh, St. Louis uh, Real Estate Investors Association uh, make a difference in you? I joined the first week I bought my place. So over 30 years ago, and I have relied on a good number of the members. Um, it, it's amazing what programs are put out there. Uh, the learning as much as you can and then speak to all the different people, the networking you can do with it. And everybody is willing to educate, teach. Um, there's always an open arm. Nobody really shuts you off. Very good, yeah. Jim, you want to say anything more? Uh, I think you you already- uh, Yeah, I mean- What you got out of the, uh, the, met your the club? Uh, I would recommend to young ones to keep on coming, get, get involved with the club, volunteer to help. Uh, you can join the board as the years go by and uh, you get to personally, a lot of times, uh, get to talk to the speakers, out of town speakers, especially uh, when maybe they're too busy otherwise, but being on the board, you have a little bit more direct connectivity with them. Um, and you just learn so much by being a member of this group. Uh, I can't, I can't say enough about it, how it's helped us out. Yep. Yep. And we appreciate your, your long time service, Jim. Uh, Thank you. Group. And um, Dan, anything you'd like to say about uh, how your membership in SGL Everybody else, you know, and all the things that everybody else said, obviously all the networking and so forth. But one of the things that I found really helpful is contractors. I mean, con it's hard to find good contractors. So, you mm -hmm. know, working with the, with the other members, you know, I've, I've picked up numerous contractors from other members. You know, they said, hey, this accountant, you know, this, this painter, this, you know, what, whatever, this plumber. So, um, and you, you kind of go through them, you know, sometimes they're good for a while and you need to find a new one. So, um, yeah, so that's been a big thing with the group is, is, is contractors finding, you know, talking to other members about contractors. You can, are, they, are the good ones retire? I don't know why they want to do that, but. Uh, I got one right now. Yeah, he's getting ready to retire on me. So. Uh, <laughs> you wore him out, Dan. Uh, yeah, but yeah, so they, they retire, they disappear, they move. Mm -hmm. they go out of business so it happens yep yep uh grace how is your membership in stl ria um made a difference for you it's pretty life-changing because i mean i'm from southern indiana and that's where um, a lot of my properties were and then i moved here for grad school and then somewhere in there i read rich dad poor dad and i was like there's another way to do this you know so I, I Googled and I found the club and I just showed up one night and then I started talking to people and then I went to um, some different functions and then I got to know people and I was like, well, you know, I like to write I'm an English teacher. And so um, that's how I started doing the newsletter and everyone on the board is just so incredibly nice. And it's just such a, a warm thing, you, you know, and it's like in, in grad school, I learned like a different vocabulary for the stuff I study. And it's like, when you go to the club meetings or even on the Zoom meetings, you talk to people who get, you know, who knows what an ARV is, you know, like, you know, things like that. So you speak a different language and people get it. And it's not just that, um, that they can help you because that's, that's so amazing, but you kind of feel like you found your tribe, whether what you like to do is like crunch numbers, like Maria mentioned, or if you, you know, you love the rehab part or you love like being on property or whatever, just things like that. And you can always, you, it's just like, it's a community and you can go there and you can just not only feel at home, but you can, you know, you know, there's other people. And if you get a nightmare tenant, someone else has had a nightmare tenant. So it's like, and if someone has a good deal, you get inspired, like, oh, that's possible, you know, all these, and like, someone might be like, well, have you tried this strategy or like putting it together a deal this way? So, you know, more minds, you get more solutions. So even when I'm teaching, I learn a lot from my students. So I, it's the same kind of thing, you know, people who know way more than me 
hopefully they get something out of talking to me, but I get a lot of talking to them. It's just the exchange of information. So yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, great. Maria, I'll let you have the last word here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you had the, the, the least amount of time as, as a member from our group. What have you gotten out of our your, your membership so far? Well, guys, I will say try moving to a new city at a time when no one can speak to each other or go anywhere. So being a part of this group kind of automatically gives me an in to make new friends. And just like Grace said, that talk my language and nerd out about the stuff I nerd out about. So you guys are all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's so invaluable, you know, and I'll give you guys a hard example. And, and it happened just within this hour, um, just as I was saying, hey, you know, my situation here in, uh, or my experience in St. Louis has been a little bit uh, challenging. Someone said, hey, Maria, have you got a person for this? And I said, no, I'm actually working on that. And they said, well, here's a referral. So I mean, it, the, the thing that Dan was talking about, sharing contact, sharing knowledge, um, it, it happens every day. And I'm sure that if tomorrow I go onto the Facebook site and say, hey guys, I'm having a little bit of a challenge with this, even though I haven't personally met any of you yet, just by being part of this group, I would have a flood of responses for, for options. Very good. Hey, uh, uh, Lloyd, let's make sure they all know that we are non-for-profit, that uh, that sets us apart, I think, from every other group in St. Louis that none of us get paid for what we do. We're here strictly to help you get you all out as board members. I think that's really important for everyone to know that uh, we just do this because we love to do it and people helped us as we uh, developed in our careers and now we want to give back. And, and that's a simple truth. Nothing more to be said about it. Yeah. Yeah, and I mentioned it when we had our, our election there. We are an organization that is owned and operated by our, our members, and we receive no compensation. Officers receive no compensation. Um, we're, just, we're just here because we got so much out of this organization early on in our investing lives that uh, when somebody asked me to be on the board, uh, somebody like Jim asked me to be on the board a few years back, I couldn't, I couldn't hardly say no. I've gotten so much out of this. I keep saying that if it wasn't for this organization, I probably would have gotten out of investing after my first couple of deals because um, in my, my day job, I was, I was known as the slumlord and with all the, the, bad, the bad news on the store, you know, the, the nightly news on you know, news at five, you hear about this landlord just letting their tenants not, not paying the water bills or turning off the heat and all the, the bad press that we get as landlords. Uh, I probably would have retired from this and, and backed out a long time ago. But this meeting with this group of people every month um, gives you, re, you know, re-energizes you to gotta keep at it and go out and do more of it. So uh, I, I agree with everybody that it's, it's uh, said similar, similar to things like that. And really, and we appreciate all your participation here tonight. That's, this is one of the one of the meetings that we, we try to do in a panel like this at least once a year. And, uh, um, and it's, it, Usually, it's one of our most uh, inspirational meetings. To not, you know, yeah, it was great hearing from Fred, you know, a national national speaker, and how to improve our elevator speeches. But uh, uh, hearing from five five people who had been in the trenches and done it for a while, and getting hearing from their experiences, that's that's really inspirational too. I know it inspires me, even after, as long as I've been in it here, and hear that, you know, hey, it's working for people. It's still working because I know that's what. What kept me, I'm surprised, like I said, Maria, you, you, if your first deal was bad, if my first deal was bad, I probably would have run for the hills. As I, I attribute my, my staying in it, along with this group, is that my first deal was fantastic. I, I read one book and said, hey, this sounds pretty good. I'll go out and do it. That's before I even joined this group. And I said, wow, it works. I bought a deal, sold it, for, made a great profit. You know, and, and, um, and then I found out about this group. Is hey, I, I got to go to a seminar. And then I joined this group and it's been a, a it's kept me at it. So I really appreciate everything that the, the, this group has done. So uh, I don't know what your time frame was, John. Uh, we're running a little after eight o'clock. Is that about? Uh, I, 
Okay. I think that's okay. I'm, I, I don't have nothing else to do tonight. Okay. <laughs> that's actually not true, but no, I appreciate these meetings very much to me. It's just like going that cause I miss so much like the, the lunches at Applebee's and everything we do, but just getting there early. It's for me, it's therapy. It's my real estate therapy. Cause we all go out our separate ways. We have all our stuff, our problems, but we can get together and talk about them and kind of laugh about it. And we do come up with solutions for each other. I mean, I've learned so much, uh, obviously, you know, been around a few years, don't need to do this, but we, maybe I do need to do this because I want to so bad because it keeps me sane for, for one thing, but it's, it, you know, everybody, we've all got our different styles and different things. And it's just, it's great to get together. I, you know, I like the zoom meetings. I do miss the live meetings, but we get, I still think we get a lot out of what we're doing right now. And I appreciate everybody, you know, in this group uh, way more than most people know. It's just, uh, you know, education is one of the things that I like to stress. One of the things I like to do, and I know this is why I'm with the group, is because I like to look at education that doesn't break the bank, you know, and I don't mind spending any money. I've spent probably more money than a lot of people have on my education. I don't mind doing that, but what do you get out of it? You know, I just, I'm in, I'm in two one-year programs right now with some of my mentors that I did. Do I need to do this? No. Okay, but I, I feel this group, our group here, St. Louis Rhea, is uh it's my lifetime group anyway. I don't ever see myself going anywhere. So that's just my, that's my little thoughts on it. I guess I, I, I talk too much, Jim, too, sometimes because we're, we're missing our in-person stuff. So if I, <laughs> <laughs> but that, it's my therapy though. That's the way I look at it. So. I, I have a question, you guys. So do we have contact information somewhere that's readily available for, say, if I wanted to reach out to Jim or, or anything like that? Um, not on our, from our membership list, particularly, um, unfortunately not everybody's on meetup. I know you're on, you're on meetup. I, I monitor the meet, our meetup site and you can message people that are on the meetup site. Unfortunately, we don't have everybody and, uh, that are, that are members on our meetup site. Um, and there's, there's a Facebook group too, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Laura, I think uh, does, does Laura handle the Facebook, Facebook, uh, yes. yes, it's not as interactive as we'd like for it to be. That's one of the, the things we are missing though, is our in-person. Cause that's when we usually exchange contacts. Um, I know one of the things we've never really just put together a list and, you know, for different reasons. I mean, there's not like people want to hide, but you know, we all have, our time is all valuable. We, we realize that. Um, that's one of the things though, that we always got in person because you could exchange your card and just, you know, see who's doing what with our networking. So I don't know if we want to maybe look at something like that. Um, I know Maria, if, if there's something in particular that you're uh, like, like our haves and, and once, um, if you come on on Fridays, we usually stick around a little bit longer and that's kind of a good way to exchange information. Um, I guess we're, we're open for anything, though, Lloyd, if you want to, you know, address any of that i mean that we can that's something we could definitely talk about yeah we as, as i'll speak as a former president here uh we've always purposely not given that contact list out because we've had vendors come in and just want to exploit the group uh and so uh normally we would be standing next to each other at the meeting i just give you my phone number i'll go ahead and give it to you right now, okay. you wanna write Ready. it down. 314-849-2578. Awesome, so thank you. you got, if you want, but you know, normally that's how you do it. You just, hey, here's my number or whatever, call me and, or I'll call you, blah, blah, blah. But we purposely don't give that out. We're very protective of our people. And uh, there are certain people out there, vendors, you know, guy selling insurance or a guy selling windows, whatever. If he gets a hold of that list, he'll walk right down and call every one of you or you'll, you know, you, you don't want that. But on the other hand, we do want to share our information. And so anyway, that's that's the long and short of it. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately that's the bad thing about not being able to meet in, in, in person and and uh, do those exchanges, yeah, because we usually allow plenty of time for networking in our regular monthly meetings. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's the beauty of the the networking, and when we are, mm -hmm. you know, there at the meeting, everybody can exchange information, and we usually have, you know, a, a break time that you can do it again before, you know, the main speakers get on. Uh, 
Yeah, and usually I'm a lot, whatever, yeah. give us a call. We'd be happy to talk to you, Maria. Usually when we meet in person, I've been the last person out the door, pushing everybody out the door. And then when I leave, there's still people standing out on the porch out in front after the doors are locked and going on. And yeah, I see Dave. Dave yeah, I would right. say Dave does that all the time. Usually, uh, <laughs> hanging around Dave, picking his brain. Or he, and, uh, he, he's one of the biggest offenders. He's one I kick out all the time. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, we all be great, glad and happy when uh, we can get back together in person. It'll be great. But in the meantime, like John said, uh, as long as uh, Kathy Davis is willing to continue with our legal updates on Fridays, we'll continue to do uh, meet with her and then share some networking and haves and wants after uh, after her session on Friday. Mm -hmm. Probably the best best way to connect right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think once again we are to just remember Ruth Hollander, uh, mm -hmm. who was yeah she she made this group. She was one of the main people that made this group what it is today. And she was 89 years old and passed mm -hmm. uh, recently and we're going to miss her, but you know, what she did for all of us and uh, just unbelievable, you know, all the positions she held on the board and she as sec as a treasurer, she watched our money like a hawk, you know, oh and financially oh we're in good shape and we're not struggling. And uh, you know, we all get great salaries. So, that's even more <laughs> impressive. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about Maria talked about you being addicted. She was definitely addicted. Even well into her 80s, she was still buying houses. Somebody would come to her with a deal and it was like, this is too good to pray. Yeah, and I bought a couple of houses this month. <laughs> you, 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 houses, farms, you know, yeah. I can go on and yeah, on. She was the most amazing uh, investor I know. She had strategies that I were, wow, and you did that? And it was like, it was, yeah, it was unbelievable. The kind of things that, the creative mind that she had in, in real estate, so. It's people, yeah. it's people skills that she had the best about. You know, she said once, you know, I've got a farm that I share crop on. And so, you know, that's where the farmers, you know, work her land and then they, you know, split the profits with her or whatever. She said, I have three farmers uh, working the land. So I, she split it into three property or three, parcels. So when the first farmer says, hey, I sold 5,000 bushels of wheat, and the second one says, I sold 2,000, and the third one says, I sold 2,000, she knows one of them's lying, you know. She said, you can get two people to connive together, but it's hard to get three. Just <laughs> think about that. That's pretty smart, you know. <laughs> this as an example, you know. Yeah. Illusion is not a crime, I hear. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> No, yeah, no, she was a great asset to this organization. She will be sorely missed. Yeah. yeah so yeah. she's it was irreplaceable. Yeah. Even though we, we appreciate Jim Choik uh standing in as uh her position on the board as treasurer, but yep. she will be missed. Yep. No. Well, I have nothing more. <laughs> and, I appreciate and, I'm, everybody. and I'm not gonna pay you guys either. It's just like you're not gonna pay us. Yeah. I don't get out and get a, turn in your bills. If unless you got a receipt, she's not paying you. So. <laughs> I know, Jim. You're an engineer too. You think you can handle that? That all that those calculations? I'll do my best. <laughs> try. Hey, Jim Heiser, real quick. Uh, if I remember right, you don't text, so you better tell Maria not to text you. Oh no, no, no. I've I've come to the 20th century. Oh, you have. Yes. Oh, I'm okay. texting now. Yeah, yeah, that's good. But, but that 849's our home la our landline. <laughs> <laughs> but I do I do text now. I got that's I got verbally uh bombarded with insults from my wife for so long. <laughs> she says you're an engineer and you don't text. I said, I don't know. I just don't like doing that stuff, but I do now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, we really appreciate all of our panelists coming on tonight, uh, taking your time and sharing sharing your stories. I mean, that's that's what this one of the things this organization is great about, hearing other people's stories and learning learning from other people's experiences. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we don't have to make those same mistakes, mm -hmm. especially for the younger folks getting, just getting started. Uh, you know, to really take heed of uh, uh, some of the, uh, the experiences, especially uh, the bad experiences of some of us then uh, you can avoid those and uh, it can be a lot uh, uh, 
you, you can there are more expensive places to get uh, get get educated and it's in the school of hard knocks mm -hmm. so if you want to go out there yeah it can be some expensive if you don't learn learn here you're going to learn and pay a lot more for it than our membership fee for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay well, again thank you all for being here mm -hmm. and i guess we'll see you, uh, on you. Friday, the next Friday. Friday. okay have a good one appreciate it yeah take care thank you